Hi everyone, this is Carrick from ACG or Angry Centaur Gaming bringing you the review for the further tales of the coked up albino witching warrior known as Geralt in Witcher 3 The Wild Hunt. This dude's been fun to play since the very first game. I mean, who doesn't want to play a character that learned his battle techniques from Cobra Commander cruises the land, buttering muffins and single-handedly knocks out entire species of creatures with a level of efficiency that makes McDonald's rape in the rainforest look poorly planned. Through this, the Witcher games have always knelt solidly into the bosom of a adult fantasy, dealing with surprisingly heavy atmospheric, environmental, social, and interpersonal issues that have really helped identify it as a unique title in a pretty crowded field when you think about it. Now this is the third title, a number that in the past hasn't been that good to other game series, as many times the narrative either becomes the game or the game becomes so slipstreamed and streamlined that it can be played by rubbing your nubbins across the controller every 30 to 40 seconds between quick time events as movie star voice actors replace the actual action. So the real question that occupies us now is if The Witcher 3 is one part Norwegian death metal video and one part Zelda Wind Waker all smashed up together, which is going to ultimately end up creating a hodgepodge of a sequel sequel catering to the masses with a soul effectively neutered by the sharpened scissors of bad game design? Or is Witcher 3 the godly combination of one-third Elric of Melon Boney, one-third Conan the Barbarian, and one-third Stevie Nicks during that sexy woodland druidic phase she had? Let's check it out and see. Remember, this review is caffeinated, which means slip and snick or snack like a vorpal sword through your brain cheese without hesitation or remorse for those souls left behind. Let's do this. Graphics, as always, are up first. You know, there's a saying, by plucking her petals, you do not gather the beauty of the flower. And in a way, that really is how this game resolves itself over time, as being more than the sum of its parts when it comes to the graphics. The atmosphere at times is heavily dark with moody moors and swamps installing feelings of dread and pregnant suspense even while on horseback and you are at times almost forcibly reminded of the horse chase in the Disney cartoon Sleepy Hollow as you race through the midnight tracks with nothing but like the bare face of the moon lighting your way. Then as dawn sort of chases away night if you're lucky enough you can find a place to watch the sunrise as that milky blue of night sort of mixes with the gold and the red of dawn. There's just places that really do at many times look like paintings. Additionally, for the most part, character models are very well done, and though there's a large number of clipping, more so than I expected, especially with clothes and beards and armor, the fact is the designs themselves are really fantastic looking, and the world gives a much wider array of looks than either title before it did and it sort of spreads the world out in front of you. The only game recently that this compares to, you know, it's probably Dragon Age Inquisition. While the locations in that game were excellent, there's an organic state in which Witcher 3's environments live that simply really can't be beat. These places, even when problems sprout up, look like they exist somewhere in a real world and does an incredible job melting you into the atmosphere. There's also a lot of high texture passes that do wonders for both the characters and monsters in the game and elicit a feeling of organic alignment with the game itself and look neither too good nor poor compared to the overall gameplay, leaving them not entirely seamless, but very, very close. Additionally, kudos for high definition skin textures and eye reflection mapping that can make characters look shockingly lifelike at times. Now, that isn't to say that The Witcher 3 is without technical issues. There's really a couple things. Water in the game is uniformly mediocre looking and really needs like one or two more passes with some texture work done on the surface in particular. Though reflections look great, the water just doesn't look real compared to say GTA 5 and some other games currently out. And it's a sore spot that's very noticeable when there really are so many bodies of water in the game world and you see them so often. Lastly, I spent a great deal of time on the PS4 and then about half that on the Xbox One and I have to say, though both consoles show adequate and many times stellar graphical ability, they are also both hampered by some technical issues such as frame rate drops during horse riding or when passing by large bodies of water or when fighting creatures or yeah, when not fighting creatures, so pretty much whenever the game wanted. See, I could never force the game to drop frames. It just randomly decided it was going to. Lastly, the landscape, though contextually sound and incredibly real realistically designed. It has some issues with severe drawing on both consoles and a lack of shadowing on various foliage that can make landscape look hyper artificial. It's not that the game looks bad because it doesn't. It's not at all. It goes from looking amazing though to looking a little bit odd at times and because of that sort of drunken swaying between the two it can be very noticeable that change in the overall lighting and it really does seem that during certain times of the day the game looks very good and at other times 
it can look highly questionable. Now, people will want to probably know which system looks best. The PS4 has a slightly sharper image at times, but the dynamic resolution used by the Xbox One seems to help it narrow that margin, and FPS hits seemed to be brutally equal on both systems without me actually having a computer system running a frame counter and looking at it that way. The graphics are good to excellent despite the occasional FPS issues and that lighting wonkiness that happens because what's going on, the way the game world looks, all of the different aspects of the game world itself, good to excellent with just the occasional what the hell. Sound, music, and voice. And we seek some peace and quiet. Out of my face, freak, for your breath sours my beer. Raven a woman dressed in black and white. Seen her? And I just have to add that yes, all three of these do exist in this game, despite four of the major reviewing publications not mentioning them at all, not even once in their review. Rant over, here we go. Sound is up first. You know, playing through Witcher 3, it's almost instantly noticeable that the game's offering an incredibly complex sound tapestry for gamers, with the discordant screams of enemies mixing perfectly with the crackling of the fire that's licking up the sides of their freakish killable faces. And just as they almost get ready to collapse in death, the Witcher runs in and chops their legs off like he has a grudge against sprinters. Everything sounds perfect, and various environmental effects, while in unique locations, are also tonally true as well, and really deeply layered, resulting in many locations having very real sounding soundscapes. Sadly, this is hampered by both consoles wreaking absolute havoc with the sound mixing at random intervals because suddenly in the midst of an epic battle with a bear as it opens its mouth to awaken the world of the cry of a true apex predator, the damn sound mixing garbled like somebody had been pissing on the speakers. What's worse is the bug shows up randomly, causes nothing but havoc and anarchy for an undetermined period of time, then leaves without another word like a drunk ex-girlfriend. It's confusing and utterly disappointing because without this bug, the sound mixing would be almost perfect for me and my system. And like all games, some tweaking might be needed for your system individually, but it was excellent. That bug just killed it for me at times. Now, when all is said and done, it is great audio, absolutely great sound effects. However, man, that audio bug was killing me. Music, you know, <laughs> you gotta take your hats off to these folks who challenge the everyday and don't just make the typical fantasy game music. Sure, they have their Conan riding a dragon holding Excalibur in one hand and an RPG in the other, battle hymns, but even those have a decidedly almost customized tact with unique woodwinds, bells, triangles, perhaps a harpsichord or two in there just for fun. It's not just the instruments I noticed that grabbed me with Witcher 3's music, it's the arrangements themselves. Many of them don't have that bombastic, multi-layered sound I expected, but instead, especially one or two of the ambient tracks, they have an almost relaxed vibe to them that goes hand in hand with the more exploratory feeling of the game itself. It was a perfect mix. Now, I'm not saying it's gonna be great for everybody. I can see some people feeling that it's a bit off for them personally, and compared to other large fantasy titles, I can see where they are indeed coming from, but for me, I loved it. Voice. Through and through, this has to be some of the best voice acting in both terms of situational awareness and overall tonality that I have ever heard. Sure, the Witcher sounds like he's taking a shit whenever he's talking to a long-lost friend, a lover he just rode the stuffed unicorn with, or a high and mighty king. But let's be honest, that's him and that's the way it's expected. However, the rest of the folks are absolutely spot on. Every single side character, no matter how small, spins their vocal budget exactly where it needs to be, lending a real, I guess, lifelike atmosphere to both the world itself while traveling, but also to just make you as the gamer actually care about. From the main missions to the side missions, even if one of those side missions involves scarring you for life during a mission I like to call what Casper the Friendly Ghost probably actually looks like. Honestly, it's excellent through and through, and it does a fantastic job in the hardest of circumstances, and that's making memorable characters in an open world game despite their coming and going like transients at a laundromat. Oh, and I have to say, 
I know voice acting is good when I either love or hate a character in a game, and there is a character in here that is a feculent bag of misappropriately shaped dicks. I have in all my years of gaming almost never hated a character as much as I hated this guy. His writing, ideals, and voice acting were a perfect storm of the worst things in mankind, and he wasn't even a main baddie. But he was absolutely tremendous. Gameplay. You play as the Witcher. Well, not just as him, but we'll get to that in a moment. You play as him searching for Ciri in a main plot that is basically search for Ciri by the most roundabout way humanly possible. So roundabout that even the main character is going to make offhand comments about it while he burns, smashes, cuts, slices, punch, kicks, rams, breaks, beheads, Jedi mind tricks, and threatens his way to victory. You see, the Witcher's looking for Ciri because she isn't with him, and now she may be in trouble, and that's about it for the main story. Seriously, in the end, Aside from a bit of a gray area, that is the main story. She isn't with you, so you need to find her. It's my morning search for sugar distilled into a fucking fantasy quest. Now, originally, a gamer might think that was a weak spot, but in Witcher 3, there's an almost hidden genius here that plays out as you explore the land and explore this fairly mundane plot. Now, I'm sure you've heard this before. You've heard it about other games, but I'm saying this, this is the first time in a game where I truly believe this, and that is... Here, the land, the side missions, and the people and the places in your decisions become the story, more so than possibly any game I can remember past or present. The main story is the most excellent of guiding lights to sort of lead you to the next location, but that is pretty much it. The game just sort of lets you go, and it's not like you're without directions. Monster slaying quests abound throughout the land, and this is a land filled with enough monsters that any sane population would announce it in mass. Fuck it. I'm out, or in a jarringly unexpected musical number like Dragon Age Inquisition. Either way, they haven't, and you're there, so it comes down to you to cleanse the land while juggling an incredible assortment of side quests. Side quests that have better atmosphere, writing, and pacing than most of the main quests in other games. No shit, if I was a writer of a main quest in another game, I'd buy Witcher 3 and study the shit out of the side quests. Some are heart-wrenching, others poignant, many are rage-inducing, a couple are just downright surprising, but all matter. All make effects on the world around you as you complete them. It is a synergy that other games would kill for, I think. In fact, if you consider many other games, it often feels like there is an, a, a bubble of impact around your character. If an NPC enters it, they say something or do something or something happens to get you to feel like you're the center of the universe. And many times, through error or just the individuality of different gameplay styles, gamers see through those cracks. They notice no one in town moving until they enter the main gates and so on. Even games that try to add life to their worlds like Skyrim ultimately fail when no one seems to be doing shit in the world. I mean, at all. Really, can't anyone else carry the three fucking goddamn oranges two houses down to the child riddled with scurvy? Witcher 3 instead does its damnedest to make the world feel like it's the star and not you. Even when your decisions make subtle or not so subtle impacts, there's a lived in feeling to the world that isn't just explained and narrative but it's reflected in the atmosphere of the game's graphical approach, down to the style of clothing and manner in which NPCs react to you, leaving you knowing you made an impact, but most importantly, here's the cool thing, wondering deep down inside if that impact is even enough, if it's gonna stick, if it's possible that all your actions might be for naught when you leave. And that gray area is unbelievably enticing to an RPG fan such as myself. To give you a little example of how they sort of create things in the world, if you ever watched the talented and now dead Bob Ross in his old painting TV show, you remember that the dude starts with a white canvas and then just throws some random colors up there and within a couple moments blobs of color in places that don't make a lick of sense and you're wondering if the dude's sweating THC. You look away to see if anyone's watching you watch Bob Ross and when you look back the dude's painted the damn Matterhorn perfectly with the expendables flying down it. From the most basic beginnings, true amazing works of creativity were created. And that is, at times, like the side quests in Witcher 3. And it sounds like hyperbole, but it's not. Many of them are multi-stage. Many of them stress the use of the Witcher's different abilities, making you feel just a little bit like a medieval Batman with detective vision. And others just lazily throw crap at you that seems mundane, but then turns out to be anything but that. Characters go from being trustworthy to being questionable, back to being trustworthy to being utter crap bastards, back to being at least somewhat acceptable, all in the same quest line. Is there a downer quest line here or there? And there is, yes, for sure. You have a couple quests that are collectible quests, and you do end up finding out that when you kill 10 elk, not all elk apparently have livers, which seems both bad for game design and for elk. But other than that, 
overall, they nailed the quests here. And I think it's that Witcher 3 just really has the core belief nailed down. Offer a basic skeleton of a story, action, system, or character, and then add layers of complexity via gameplay and interaction versus a cutscene or other non-player agency gameplay situation. From the easier to understand but highly powerful crafting and alchemy systems that can easily be the difference between life or death, and even the collectible card game of Gwent. And apparently this game has taken the world by storm. It's fairly easy to be begin with as you have a set number of cards that you draw at the starting of the game that have to be used between the two rounds with no extra draws at all. So sometimes losing the first round to have extra cards in the second makes sense. You place cards in one of three battle formations, melee or close range, then ranged, and then ballisticai like catapults and cat launchers and shit. Each battle line is added up and the player with the most total points during the end of the turn wins. You can keep placing cards or you can pass if you feel like you're going to win that turn easily or lose easily. And there are also weather cards which fuck up one battle line location like icy ground would mess up people fighting hand to hand or fog would screw up archers lives and maybe heavy rain would make firing a pissed off bag of cats from a catapult more difficult. Many people in the world sell the cards or play and you can win their cards and since it's a collectible card game that actually makes sense and you want to do it. You know it sounds basic but the mix of rounds, the one draw, and various weather effects really offers a surprisingly robust tactical element and I have played it a bunch. But I bet you a bunch of you are saying, listen, The Witcher isn't about collectible card games or side quests, it's about fighting. And that's valid though. Listen, I'm going to be honest, in the past games I always felt a bit like Anakin Skywalker is played by Hayden Christensen, an uber powerful death dealing son of a bitch with the clunkiest of outside shells and I might as well have just told everybody my main special power was pretending I wasn't attracted to Natalie Portman. I mean, in the past games, though The Witcher's always been a cool cat and a powerful one, many times the combat systems just didn't reflect that easily or readily, as I would have liked, and I'm sure many fans agreed. Here in Witcher 3, a good deal of that has been rectified with a far sleeker and more responsive fighting system that is merged with the powerful signs magic of Witcher fame in a format that's easily digestible but very customizable. Attacks and combos and movement and counter strikes have a slickness to them that just didn't exist in the previous games, and adding in blade oils and various magics and enemy weaknesses means that the synergy that a Witcher would need to have is actually finally reflected on the TV screen. It's just really that smooth and the additional edge and quickness and lethality is easily noticeable and handled with excellence regardless of which controller I was using. The menus aren't set up perfectly for controllers but they aren't Skyrim bad either. Even the role-playing attributes and skills have been streamlined, but lucky enough there are enough good choices and builds that many different witchers will be seen running around before I think any of you find someone playing in an identical fashion. Building a fast attack, highly mobile witcher, or a mix and match magic dealing oiled blade using Assassin of Kings is viable, as are all the variations between. It's really a great system for giving each player some individuality, but still reflecting the core ideals of the witcher character class, and it's also augmented by superbly tweaked difficulty levels, where normal is really a sublime mixture of reflecting the Witcher's power and historical badassness, while the hardest difficulty should just be called OSYD or Oh Shit You're Dead. Now sadly while playing you will notice that all this world building and connectivity and all these systems may have brought a couple of the Witcher 3 QA testers to their knees. Exactly. From the forest to the mountain shore, but here, near the main road. Maybe it's the war. Corpses everywhere, the stench of blood, burnt flesh. Drives monsters crazy sometimes. Men too. We need to watch ourselves in White Orchard. And we should leave as soon as we learn it. The game isn't the buggiest game I've played, but it has some doozies, like characters just disappearing for a great deal of time, but the Witcher not seeming to notice, so he keeps talking to them like they were there, and surprisingly, and not the least bit creepy, they still talk from their invisible mouths on their invisible horses about mundane shit. Herds of animals do battle with the forest by headbutting trees at an inane pace, slam dancing through the shrubbery until they find a path to freedom, which some of them bound to, like escaping orca whales, while two or three always seem to sit back and ponder if leaving means the end of buckets of free fish. It's pretty crazy at times. I've also seen a couple NPCs fly into the air like someone hooked missiles to their feet and I can only assume it's a ragdoll error or otherwise. And then sometimes the environments act a little funky at times with trees blazing away in a wind strong enough to tear the fake smile off a Kardashian but characters and other clothes and areas aren't affected at all. In fact, many times it looks like the foliage is infected with brittle bone syndrome, flinging this way and that like it's going to collapse, only there isn't any wind. 
Not a huge deal, but enough bugs that I can't easily remember a title uh, with this many recently. Now, fun factor. It's a blast, and I mean it. Whether I'm following a side story that has the writing chops of the main stories of most other fantasy games in the past 10 years, or I'm betting winches, or refusing to act properly in front of a king, I am always solidly enjoying myself. If I'm in a battle, I'm constantly identifying new ways to use skills, to hunt down monster packs, or to bring down a big daddy. The game just feels right, and sure the main story is a skeleton of action, a thing built to do nothing but move the body forward, but truly isn't that maybe what these games should be? This is an open world game where for much of it, the open world feels enjoyable to explore with, uh, you know, not many fetch quests to steal fun from your time there. And it feels for the first time like this is a true world. It's also a massive world. I mean massive. And though it's not fully open world with large lands having one load to enter, the game is almost still staggeringly huge. The game's easily 35 hours with you doing nothing but the main quest and easily the 200 hours that they say if you end up doing most of the side quests. There is that much content. It is almost MMO in size. Now, I rate games on a buy, wait for a sale, rent, or never talk about it again rating scale. As you can already tell, this is a buy. It is a tremendous title. It's probably one of my favorite titles this year easily, if not within this year and last year. It solidly beats other titles that are like this title that have come out before and really puts it above and beyond the rest. So that's it for me. If you like the video, hit like. If you dislike it, dislike. If you want to share us, you can share us on Twitter or any Reddit and, and so forth. And we also have a donate page. It would really help us if you guys can, uh, you know, go to that page and maybe see if something on the Patreon on site interests you you know we do have contests and so forth on that site or you can just donate through paypal on the main page peace out